evening, everybody. You're most welcome to this evening's Let's Talk Equine webinar. Um, hope you're all keeping well out there, wherever you're joining us from this evening. And I am joined this evening by, in the room here, by two very hardworking ladies from the West. Um, one at home in the West this evening and the other, uh, Philippa, where are you tuning in from this evening? Hiding in a bedroom in Meath, Wendy. That's where I'm currently <laughs> tuning in from. And Hannah, you are in? I'm at home in County Mayo. In County Mayo. Yes. So look, at delighted to have you both here with me this evening. I really appreciate you taking time out of your very busy lives to do this. Um, and I know that our audience will appreciate your delivery here this evening as well. Just speaking to our audience this evening before we get started. Um, Look, as usual, there is the opportunity for uh, those of you who are joining us this evening to send in your questions throughout the webinar. We'd really love to hear from you and um, encourage you to do that. You can do it at any stage throughout and we'll get them in, 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 in due time. Um, just a note to say, please don't use the chat function. Use the Q&A tab. I don't have uh, time to be flipping back and forth between Q&A and chat. So if you could use Use your Q&A tabs, that would be absolutely wonderful. Um, and I suppose, you know, look at the topic this evening is different horses for different courses. And some might be wondering, you know, what we intend to talk about in the sense of different horses for different courses. And I guess the different courses bit of it is really alluding to the fact that we're talking about some very versatile uh, individuals this evening and the 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 different different horses bit of it I suppose also alludes to the different breed types and crosses that we're going to be talking about as well too but coming to yourselves I mean you know you're also two different ladies in terms of your own personal talents and the diversity of what you have been about over the years as well too and you know you've both grown up in Mayo you've both grown up in families that are immersed in horses and ponies you've been around horses and ponies all your lives you've been around each other all of your lives and you know each other very well and you know your your each other's horses and ponies over the years very well and I suppose you know the other commonality with both of you also is that you are not now full time involved in horses. You both have your own career paths. Hannah, your physiotherapist, and Philippa, your teaching. Would you like to maybe you know if I come to you first, Philippa, just to give your own couple of words for those like you're you're very well known across the sector. I'm not sure about most that, Wendy. <laughs> Most people would be reasonably familiar with, with the pair of you, I am guessing. But for those who maybe aren't, maybe if you just give us a little bit of a, an insight into who you are and what you do. No problem. Well, obviously my name is Philippa Scott and I'm from just outside uh, Balna, County Mayo, not a million miles away from my peer here, Hannah. And um, as you said, Wendy, we've grown up together. So it's I think it's really nice because we actually come from different equine backgrounds and so far as Hannah would come from maybe more of a show jumping background um, and I would have come from two parents who would have been primarily involved with eventing um, and then show production of show horses so I would have grown up um, doing a little bit of show jumping just locally and um, where I would have competed against Hannah and with Hannah and um, kind of our younger years um, and Turlock, they, that was one of the well-known venues for our <laughs> show jumping leagues. Uh, and then Pony Club, IPS, um, so the Irish Pony Society, BSPS over to the UK to compete mm -hmm. um, and kind of making a couple of trips over there every summer to kind of campaign our, our ponies in what we would have deemed kind of a bigger a bigger space, a bigger opportunity. Um, my mother would, or my mother and my father were both very involved, but mum really would have kind of trailblazed us as children doing those trips. And um, as Hannah knows, she was a very determined lady. So she'd always have maybe kind of um, one open pony for us to campaign and a couple of novice ponies to bring on. And that's where it really kind of that beginning of this kind of production, selling, buying began um, with her and with this. Mum and dad would have always done it for years, but really kind of the way it went is thanks to her and through her and dad. 
so yeah, yeah. and, and I, I i suppose it's worth mentioning that you your brother also is yeah, oh yeah and christopher yeah sorry christopher and i both competing yeah. yeah that's what in when i say we that's who yeah. i mean is christopher and i and you'll see he's yeah. mentioned in or he's pictured in a couple of photographs and at the moment and i'm very lucky as it is because as you said i'm teaching full-time and i'm based in Meath with my partner who's actually a racehorse trainer and um, so we do a little bit of rehoming and retraining of racehorses racehorses there too but i'm very lucky then at home i have my brother and my father who can keep everything on the road at home when i am it's always been that way even when i was working in dublin and things and um, they keep the show on the road so it's great yeah support the sports the support team yeah yeah so Hannah, coming across to you, um, maybe if you could give a little bit of an insight into your, you know, journey and what you're at now and all of that. Um, so I'm Hannah Gordon and I live just outside Cross Line in County Mayo. So both sides of my family, are like I'm steeped in bike horses and show jumping. Um, my dad has like he rides for a living and then my mom is uh Corcoran so they run Riverview Equestrian Centre so I had it on my mom's side and my dad's side so as Philip has said I grew up show jumping um kind of riding young ponies riding lots of different things um I did a little bit of showing when I was younger but that wasn't really my focus mm -hmm. so the showing really came into it um Liam Linsky asked me to ride Black Shadow and after I did a couple of the Working Hunter qualifiers for Dublin with him I grew to love it um and it kind of just developed from there. So from the working hunters led into a little bit of showing. I've done some dressage. I've done some young event horse classes. Okay. Um, so I work now, as you said, as a physiotherapist. Um, it's I work for a charity in Sligo called the MS Centre. Okay. And I'm really lucky that I work three days there. So that gives me time that I can still ride in my own yard. Um, we have our own horses there and that I can still get up to Leans in the evening and ride some of his horses. Okay. So do you get sleep? Sometimes. <laughs> Good to know. Good to know. Yeah. <laughs> and, I, and I suppose, you know, this evening, look at, you know, the idea is to give people a little bit of in, an insight into some of the animals that you guys have worked with over the years. Um, you know, both in the sense of, I suppose, the qualities that you guys look for and, you know, the, you know, unique selling points, we want to call it that, of the various animals that you're going to talk about. And also, I guess, you know, the the, the the marketability and the marketing of some of these as well too so we're going to talk about a couple of those different areas um without further ado I'm going to get into doing a screen share here and we'll we'll start the conversation and to encourage those who maybe have just joined since I since I did the intro we really welcome your questions um the the, the girls can't wait to 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 share their their thoughts with you all so do get into questions um girls i'm going to ask you to confirm to me that that is actually sharing i have to just get yep. your video panel up again for myself that's doing all right is it mm -hmm. yep. okay so i suppose um you know for the kind of animals that we're going to talk about this evening the temperament bit and the handling bit and the you know, the ride ability, the work ability with them is a crucial part of that conversation. So I'm going to put this on play and whichever of you, you can decide yourselves there who wants to start the conversation to talk us through this and why we have it here. Do you want me to start? No, I'll, let you, I'll let you take this one, Anna, considering okay. it's you at the start. Yeah. Um, so this would be an example of like a sales video that I would make. Um, he was a three coming four year old. Um, so he obviously wouldn't have had loads of experience going to shows or anything like that. But if I was looking at that video, I'd be looking at his temperament. You know, he's standing there quietly. He's very happy for me to be in and around his legs, to pick up his feet, to groom him. You can see by his face, he's really relaxed about everything. You know, nothing looks like an issue there. He's happy to load um, and unload. So you're thinking, I guess if you were buying that, you know, that you'd be able to manage them by yourself, that you'd be able to tack them up and untack them and groom them and everything else. Um, another like really important thing, obviously, there is the mounting video. Um, so I for me, I just think that that shows correct production because the mounting video didn't happen in one day. You know, you had to prep that you had to practice from the very first day that he'd learn to stand still. That, and it's not the thing. It just shows like. That he's confident and relaxed with his rider that he's willing to stand still he's not worried when i'm getting up there 
So that's all showing temperament and handling. And I guess as well that he's kind of got a good start in life. I think um, when we were talking about this before, Hannah, you were saying how important that is or has been, say, due to COVID and the nature that the the way that sales changed and how the nature of that kind of moved online. And if people couldn't see that or in, uh, you know, in the sales in Clifton, you can't necessarily see all of that. You might not have that opportunity and how that's been an invaluable tool for you in relation to that. I think we're going to discuss yeah. it later on a bit more, too. But I think you definitely said that it was a bonus. Yeah, definitely. Um in my opinion, like really good videos like that, I think it definitely adds, I would say, at least a thousand euro onto your pony, particularly for the likes of that pony that doesn't have results yet. You know, how can you show that he's going to be able to do the job that the person that's buying him wants him to do? And it's videos like that that shows it. Um, and I think in recent times, stuff like pony standing at the mountain block has become more and more important. I remember Vera Phillips saying it in a talk years ago that when he'd come to Ireland first, you know, they'd throw the jockey on and the horse would be moving as he got on and that looks really impressive for the jockey but when you're selling them that's absolutely useless so it just little tips like that I think really helps when you are selling them. Well particularly in the context of I suppose the level of the market that we're talking about in the sense of you know your your amateur your pleasure horse your you know that sort of type of clientele I guess is in general what we're talking about here this evening as opposed to the high level sport mm -hmm. and you know that sort of safety factor is so important and if you're selling to a family whereby whereby maybe you know it's it's mummy riding today but it could be the daughter or the son riding tomorrow as well you know um that 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 plays as part Philippa this this is this is your Rodney um, yeah, well it's like, just a, a clip of I think me going up and open showing that I can open and close the gate so in contrast to Hannah and the Connemara pony this is a big 17 hand plus draft so it's just showing that he has the temperament to stand open and close the gate um actually the people I was you know selling to in this point they were buying on scene so I was kind of just dotting all my I's and crossing all my T's to show them as much as I could of you know how sensible and how sane he is um and I think that this kind of just proved it as well and I think in a COVID world this became a much more normal thing because you had to do it and um, now I actually sold him last year to clients who bought another horse off me so they were taking my word for it but I still wanted to show them that this is you know he, he is exactly what as he says in the tin so it's also me herding cows with my brother on the quad and I think there's a video of me in a second doing a not so very elegant around the world and a half scissors not very just, elegant no not, so, it was not probably the slowest one I wouldn't want to have my timer out but just to show you know he was like this Hannah knows him she saw him at the shows like like you could have done this in the middle of the ring and it wouldn't have made any difference to him so just to prove to those people that you know my word is what my word is and I think that's really important in this industry as well and as you said when we're talking about an amateur market um you know Hannah and I we've always said um as friends that you know you know not everyone breeds that 145 horse not everybody breeds that grand prix dressage horse not everybody breeds that three four star event horse where do all of the horses in the middle go like where do they go so that is a huge market within the industry you know um i was looking at it earlier and, and, and also like, just as i'm looking at this as well too i'm thinking to myself you can't fake this no, <laughs> no. you can't take it in clips yeah yeah no, I think, so you're showing genuineness here as well yeah and as well as that like for we'll say philippa or myself when that horse leaves your yard you don't know how he's managed you don't know what they feed him what his routine is what bit they have in his mouth what saddle they have in his back and if they come back and they say you know he's doing this he's misbehaving like that's proof that that's not his regular form you know that that's almost a safety net for you um, to say that, that, you know, genuinely he is what I said he is. Um, because, like, obviously routine and feed and tack and everything, it makes a big difference to a horse's behaviour. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. yeah, that's a very relevant point, Hannah. So we're moving on to the first of our um, subjects, if I call it that, this evening. Um, we have um, Le Polar Bear. Polar and Bear. Philippa, Philip, uh, this, is, this is from your side of the house. Yes. And yeah. like even, you know, as I looked even today at this, even even these four four images of themselves, you know, really demonstrate how versatile this yes. asset is. Yeah. 
Well, he was a very special polar bear junior. We called him at home. And um, as you've pointed out, as you can see in the, you know, the four images, he hunted, he evented, he went sideways. I actually don't have a, I don't have a jumping picture of, of him in, say, doing working hunters either, but he did that as well. Um, I rode him, my brother rode him. Um, I think nearly everybody in the yard at home in our equestrian centre rode him at some point. Um, we bought him from Dave Ryan in Galway. Unfortunately, he, his breeding wasn't recorded. I think he was um, a slight accident. They do sometimes happen, Wendy. Um, okay. he, I think, <laughs> um, <laughs> but he was Irish draft, thoroughbred, kind of our pony cross. Um, and he had, you know, you wouldn't have thought, I think my dad thought mum was mad, but it was the summer I went on my J1. My dad thought mum was mad bringing Christopher off eventing on him. He said he'll never finish inside the time. And I think he went clear in his two or three events. He did Krakora and Skartine. I think there was maybe one other. He went clear inside the time cross country. And, you know, and he proved, he'd always proved to us, whatever we threw him into, whatever I did with him, he always shone through. I remember that picture on the left of Tattersall's side saddle. There was the, an English judge over um, and she said to me on the first day, she said, oh, he's a nice horse, you know, what do you do with him? And I said a little bit of everything. And I don't think she quite believed me until I was second in the side saddle. I won the small hunters and I was second in the restricted open working hunters all underneath that one judge. And after the, after the two day show, she said to me, oh, I believe you now. She really, he, he, <laughs> do, he does do a little bit of everything. Um, but you can see him pictured top right there. He was event, uh, hunting as a three year old. Um, Mum and I spotted him in Cavan with um, Chloe Hester, who'd probably been well known to some people as well. Um, so she had him out producing him for Dave Ryan and then Mum just had to have him and we decided we had to have him. And I was very lucky to qualify for Horse of the Year show on him and I was placed at Royal International as a small hunter. So he won quite a lot um, and was very consistent for me. But like that and like we've discussed, you can see there in the picture of him carrying the side saddle, he was a true stamp of kind of like a nice Irish hunter. I'd, I'd say like everyone he was 15 too but everyone would say to me he's a mini middleweight so he'd carry a little bit of weight but he has a leg in every corner he has lots of presence you can see in the picture of him galloping as well you know he has a lovely expression the picture of him jumping eventing he just always had a bit of presence presence about him um, and everybody just loved him I suppose his color made him a little bit unique as well because he was that color his whole life um, but a leg in each corner he was you know clean limbed um good shoulder you know he'd carry you he'd carry you all day hunting that's what you want to be on when you have like a nice hunter show horse um with the right attitude and now he's in England living a very happy life doing a little bit of dressage and a little bit of eventing and hacking and you know I still I went to visit him you know a few years ago and I went off hacking on him myself and they're the type of horses I'd love to have you know 10 more of them and have been very lucky to have some who are very similar to him too how long did you have him for Philippa I think it was six years in total in the end five years anyway five years which is unusual for us but he was a bit special um and what I was saying to you earlier as well was that when I was working part-time work, working full-time in Dublin he was the type of horse I could come home to and it didn't matter if I hadn't ridden him in a week 10 days it didn't matter if dad just lunged him the day before I came home he'd be the exact same you know and at home when I am working full time and not able to get home as much as I used to the horses need to be able to get in a routine where they are lunged for a couple of days maybe get out a couple of days or every day and then when I come home they're worked for those two or three days and then the same routine carries on um, and he just was a bit special so we kind of kept him and had a bit of fun with them. And you mentioned the UK market there like how valuable is it to have you know like like you say the the versatility of this invaluable guy. Wendy like invaluable like if you could give me 10 of those tomorrow I'd have them gone you know that's the reality of it and um, there's another horse I'm going to talk about in a couple of slides again and I had him sold within a matter of weeks in the yard but I just kept the ride on him you know if if I could stand over them all like I could stand over him and they have the presence the confirmation the movement the type then that's you know you can't you can't ask for much more than that mm. And last question on this, you know, I suppose there is no such thing as the perfect, you know, the perfect horse. No. So like even as a show horse, as a, you know, like, OK, like eventing, hunting, you know, there's 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 an acceptability that there can be confirmational flaws there. Yes, but definitely. As, as a as a as a show animal, you know, like, can you get away with? 
Yeah. You know? So to but, be, comp- I'll be very honest with you. You actually might be able to see it, but he later in with throughout his career with us, he actually did throw a small spit, mm-hmm. um, but it reabsorbed. So it kind of nearly looked like it was part of, you know, his bow, his bone under his knee was a little bit thicker, but he did have a splint. Um, and I still qualified. I won. He actually, I went to the Royal Highland in Scotland and he won the Hoy Small Hunter Qualifier. I won the Intermediate Show Hunter class and I won the Side Saddle class on him. Uh, at, that was me competing in Scotland against obviously other UK competitors. Um, and like that was a dream come true for me. Um, but he did all of this with the splint and he placed at Royal International. He was uh, seventh in the Small Hunter class there against all the top professionals. Um, he placed with the splint as well. So those more minor conformational falls definitely can be overlooked. Um, something like a curb maybe would be more unforgivable. So it's um, things that are deemed to be kind of unsoundness um, versus kind of smaller conformational falls or maybe a small scar from out hunting or something like that, a blemish that could be disguised. Um, because there, as you said, there is no such thing as a, a perfect horse. Um, and it's, it is a very subjective discipline. Hannah and I have often discussed this and I know you have as well, Wendy, it is subjective. So what might one judge might think is unforgivable. Another would say, Oh, actually, I don't mind that. You know, it, it's fair. It is subjective. Yeah. Yeah. But I guess even here and looking at these four photographs, aside from the showing side of it, you're also showing that, you know, there's the performance piece in here as well too. Definitely. Yeah. So um, let me just get back onto this. Um, so somebody has just sent an, a note in there about slides not moving, but we actually hadn't moved any slides up to this point. So hopefully we are all now with um, Hesh hands free. So Hannah, uh, this is this is back to your neck of the woods. Um, yep. I'll, I'll set the video playing um, so you can confirm with me that it is actually playing. Yeah, it's playing. Yeah. OK, so um, you you introduce us here and, and, and tell us what, what what we're looking at. So this was hands free. So um, a good friend of ours, Michael Barrett, bred him and we had him as a three coming four year old for breaking and backing and dad had hunted him a little bit. So uh, to be fair, I, I did know what I was getting into when I bought him. So because of COVID, he didn't really do anything as a four-year-old. And in his five-year-old year, I bought him. And this was, I think, my first or second ride on him. Um, so I suppose what I liked about him, I absolutely loved his temperament when we had him for back. And he was really pretty. Um, that photo might not be the best photo of him. But you can see like that there was potential there that he's going to turn into a really lovely horse. Um, he looks like that he's not the best mover in that video. But actually, when he was loose in the field, he covered fabulous ground you know he had a really big ground cover in step um so then you're what, what age is he in this video he just turned five and that's probably his first his second ride i think it was in about six months okay um so this was really a before video i wouldn't have i wouldn't be sharing this on facebook as, as a sales video or anything like that um but this was just something to compare him to um what I liked is, I'm not sure, you can see there, you know, he's kind of fighting against me a little bit there and he, he's just struggling to ride an outline. But even here, he's already starting to drop his head and relax and move better. And that was within, you know, up five minutes. So you could tell that he had a really good trainable attitude. So you knew that you had something to work with there. You can see when he goes into canter, his head comes up in the air. Um, and as I said, he didn't look like he moved as good under saddle as he did loose. So that for me, that wouldn't put me off him at all. But what it made me think was why. So, you know, it turned out he hated that bit and I he also wasn't a big fan of the saddle. Mm-hmm. So just maybe go back and have a look at the bit and the saddle and things like that. But for me, he he had the, you know, he had everything there that he had the potential that I had something to work with. Mm-hmm. So then moving on, how what period of time are we looking at between then and this? um that's about a year later actually i probably all maybe actually it could be 10 months that Mm -hmm. was in january or february i think i got him in maybe uh like march or april the previous year Mm -hmm. so that was a combined training event in milcham equestrian center so i mean look at the difference um and it wasn't that he did like he he wasn't killed with work in that 10 months he was a really nice horse you could leave him out the field you could pick him up and put him down whenever you needed um and it was actually really from this show onwards that I like nearly got stuck in and we did a lot more shows with him 
Um, but it's not even the difference in how the way you're going. It's the difference in the musculature. It's the difference in the... Yeah. Like, I think everything. Like, in a way, he, he wasn't ready for that kind of work and those consistent shows until then. So I was really glad that we did take our show, time with him. Like, as a five-year-old, he tricked away. He did a few show jumping shows, just training shows um, and that kind of thing, but nothing major. And as I said, he was in and out from the field. Um, so this the video that's playing was actually like the sales videos that I used when I was selling them. So you can see that he did literally absolutely everything. The first video was combined training. Here he is show jumping around a meter and top of ride equestrian. This again was combined training, but almost like arena eventing because you had some cross country fences in the arena. Um, and you can just see how confident he is, how happy he absolutely loves the job. His ears are pricked looking for the fence. I mean, as Philippa said, if she could have 10 polar bears, she'd be happy. If I could have 10 of him, I... He was so much fun to jump around the course events and stuff. Mm -hmm. Here he is doing workers at the Northern Ireland Festival. So he was second in the workers that day. Um, and that put us into the championship. He jumped around Balmoral. He had a fence down, you know, he was a babyish mistake at that stage in the year. But I was still really, really happy. He had a super attitude, you know, he kept going and he kept looking for the next fence. Mm -hmm. um, and I again, you know, just showing him cross country, like he'd jump hedges, he'd jump water. And in terms of selling him, like you're showing that he can do, like if you want to event him, I'm showing that he can event. He has flat work, he has show jump and he has cross country. If you want to do workers, you can see that on the video he's going to do workers. And um, I, I yeah. suppose, Hannah, like, you know, okay, like we see you, what you're showing in this is you're showing the, the days when he's out and about, you know, but there's a lot of work behind the scenes before the yeah. out and about. What yeah. kind of what kind of stuff are you doing or were you doing in that 10 month period at home? Uh mainly flat work, to be honest with you. I think you you really can't get past a good basic flat work. Um, you know, they're they're not going to jump a smooth round unless the flat work is good. Their musculature isn't going to change unless they're doing the correct work and getting the correct feed. Like all of those things have to come together. Uh, in some of the videos there, you see, you know, we weren't maybe turned out as well. That would be schooling days. So we would do lots of schooling days. Um, what I would say, if you're thinking about selling your horse, video everything. It's so easy to delete a video if it's not good. But we we'll say if we didn't video that day, you know, we're like, oh, God, you know, we're only in our, our Navy job person. He's not flattered and blah, blah, blah. And then he jumped. Fabulous. Like you, you can never go back and do that again. He might never jump as good again. Um, just with this clip here, this was the championship. And at the end, I think I just showed that he walks in and he stands in the middle of the ring. And again, for me, that's shown temperament because some horses just won't stand, you know. Stands around, yeah. Yeah, he stands there and he's quite happy. And again, you know, he's in the pocket and he's on a long rein and there's other horses riding around. Watching um, all these make me realise we don't take enough videos, Hannah. I, I don't have, I need to train yeah. Philip up a bit more on the camera, I think, or well, bring, I'll have to get organised. I have to say, it's probably something that me and Dad and Lean argue about the most. <laughs> <laughs> um, because I want everything videoed. Um, but, you know, when it comes to selling them, they're happy that they have the videos. But dad says, oh, you can't enjoy the, watching the jumping when you're videoing. You know? <laughs> but but having, said, funny. having said that, Hannah, I guess as much as you're saying to video everything, I, 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 I also read in between the lines from you as well that, you know, you might video everything. But also when it comes to putting the, the sales video together. Yeah you're actually quite choosy about what you will then put into it. Oh, absolutely. You don't share everything. Like, as I said, that first video would never make my Instagram or Facebook page. Like that is not showing what I want to show. Yeah. Um, when we sold that horse, somebody said, uh, oh, of course, you were entitled to get on well. You know, look at all you've done with him. He must have been out every weekend this year. And actually he wasn't. Mm -hmm. uh, but we had a video every time he went out. And we had a video that we could share every time he went out because he, he was ready for everything he did. So that was the difference. We, we didn't need to do 100 outings to get one video. Mm -hmm. um, and I suppose that's kind of the prep at home. And, and that was what the 10 months before that were about. And what's his home now? What, who is his market, shall we say? Who is his, who is um, his home? I, I think like 
he he can go to a teenager coming off ponies and he can event and do workers you know he could go to an amateur he could go to a riding club he he would jump like he jump on 20 track no problem so he can go to somebody he's he's super competitive like it's not many horses well at the moment it's not many horses but i think there could be more horses that every weekend that there's something different on that you could bring him to like he's at, at the, that photo there he's at the dressage national championships if we lived on the right side of the country i would have mm-hmm. invented them but it's just too <laughs> far away but like for somebody you know that maybe wants one horse and just wants to enjoy them and wants to be able to get out every weekend like he's going to be perfect and not only that but he's going to be competitive with all of that mm-hmm. yeah but you you also have to kind of i suppose know their value as well too yeah yeah but I think that all, doing all of that adds value yeah. if if I had taken him the first day and I said oh he, he's only a show jumper we're just going to do show jumping I like I'm cutting off some of the market when he was at the sales like I had people coming up to me you know and messaging from different countries but some of them you know, wanted to do show and there was a girl, she was absolutely mad about it and all she wanted was a 158 worker for Hoyes and he would have done that. And likewise, you know, there was an Italian lady on and she wanted a show jump and there was a, a Scottish lady, she was there also and she really wanted an inventor. But because he had the videos of him doing all those things, he, he could do all those things, absolutely. And you could back up that he could do all those things. And, you know, I suppose, you know, just the fact that you mention, you know, Italy and, you know, outside the country, beyond the the, the the shores of our island, like, how do you reach out to people? Is it your social media? Is it, you know, what's your, what's your mechanism to actually, you know, okay, you'll have your customers that you know, and that you have developed relationships with, but you're also trying to reach new people. How do you do that? And I put that question to the both of you. Actually. Well, Hannah Gordon is the social media queen when it comes yeah. to doing her. I'm, I might be good for a before and after photo. And I have definitely, well, you are definitely. Exactly, yeah, the queen of the before and after. Yeah. Photo. <laughs> sure. um, and um, no, definitely have built up connections or keep in contact with contacts yeah. on social media. Definitely. Um, there's a, a, a couple of pictures I'll show you later on that literally sold horses for me on social media. Um. But I think that Hannah would agree that it really is the way that the market has gone. I I think it kind of shoots yourself in the foot a bit sometimes because I think I've often said this, that like, say, if Christopher and I or dad wanted to put something into the sales, people would actually say to us, oh, why do the Scots have that in sales? Oh, there must be something wrong with it. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas actually, it might just be that we don't have a client that would suit it. Um, but for the most part, um. Yeah, a lot of it is kind of built up through connections or word of mouth, actually. Word of mouth is very good as well. You might say to someone, oh, I have this. It would do this job. Um, And they might have a friend who's looking or people. I might even put up a post on Facebook being like, you know, searching for in the country this weekend, looking for X, Y and Z. Um, And I've really found that either social media or word of mouth are kind of the two mainstays at the moment for me anyway. Yeah. And I think, as you said, Philip, I keep it in contact with ponies you sell. So. I suppose like a nice little link is that the pony in the first video, the temperament and handling video, the, for example, I've kept in contact with those people and they're getting on great and that's wonderful. But when his videos went up on Facebook, they were sharing them and they were like, oh, look at this pony from Hannah Gordon, you know, another one like our one. And like, for me, that was fantastic. Yeah. And do, do you, do you place a lot of value on social media, Hannah? Yeah, I think so. You can reach a huge, um, you know, just like the whole world, really, via social media. And, and um, just as a matter of interest, are you a Facebook only or are you an Instagrammer or what are uh, you? I, Getting into the complicated areas now. Uh, yeah, I, I love making videos and reels for Instagram. So I do. <laughs> Yeah, Anna loves a good Instagram competition as well. The sharing likes <laughs> for sharing likes. But uh, yeah. I, I need to be trained up on Instagram. But anyway, moving on from that, <laughs> Instagram is the future, Wendy. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm still. I'm, Get I'm her on still TikTok generation. soon, Hannah. Get her on TikTok now. That'll be the next one. No, TikTok's beyond me. Okay. <laughs> But I guess, like, I suppose I'm thinking, you know, in saying that and I'm jesting in a way, but, you know, like part of your part of your audience when you are selling ponies, like 
part of your clientele is the children themselves in a way you know and they're engaging with TikTok and god knows what else so i mean do you have to be a little bit savvy across those audiences now as well definitely i think so and there's very good you know um i think there's some for sale pages and things on some of those social media platforms where you can share um which are very very valuable or people as i said put up posts like searching for um so it's a really invaluable tool and definitely we're you know later on we're going to talk a little bit about the thoroughbreds but to do with the rehoming of the thoroughbreds definitely i've used social media um to kind of help aid me in that venture as well so it definitely is it's prominent and as you know you could have you know mommy daddy i want to go see this pony that could be very relevant too at some point so yeah yeah. Not, not that we're suggesting that you know the children should take off uh, as you were saying Wendy sometimes yeah. it's the younger clientele we had a pony and um, I had shared videos or reels of her on Instagram and photos and a 12 year old bought her off me to show them in the UK and you know her mother texted me or messaged me later I've never met these people now Lean had been talking to them so it wasn't a uh, totally random but she's messaged me and said I do realize that my daughter is buying the whole like, oh, that's good, you know? <laughs> yes well look at we're, we're on to another subject for for now um uh, SCT and me um so this this uh this one is Harmony de Rev by Harlequin and Carell so Philippa this is back to your your side so- of the house and you had had this from the start I've had this from the start. So this is a little homebred horse um, that is out of my Harlequin do Corel mare. That she's still probably my base um, brood mare. I think I have um, five or five on the ground um, out of her. No, six now, actually. Six on the ground out of her. And um, he was my first. So the golden boy. Mm-hmm. Um, he wasn't the golden boy as a two yearling, two, three, four year old. I think I might have mentioned to you that there was nearly war because, as you said, not everything is perfect. And this horse, as a young horse, was not a straight mover at all. Mm-hmm. And my father informed me very directly that he would turn hay. So he thought my <laughs> showing ambitions were gone out the window. And then also, I think I was aiming to breed a slightly bigger horse um, because my Harlequin Duke Corel mare is about 16 one. Um, and Hermes de Rev obviously was an international show jumper with Clem McMahon. Um, so I was looking for blood and quality and something maybe I was trying to be one of those people who wanted to breed a 145 horse, you know. But at the same time, we've always said that we want to breed something that ideally has good confirmation, mm-hmm. ideally moves well, mm-hmm. ideally jumps a bit and ideally has a great temperament. And in whatever okay. order you want to put those that's what we've been kind of talking about today you know absolutely now answer me this question right yes. when you when you um met uh Henri as a foal and you went through then the phase of the yearling the two-year-old and so forth did you see qualities as a foal that came back to you later definitely so we say and I think a lot of others do as well three weeks three months three years now the three-year-old mightn't <laughs> we mightn't have squeezed that margin but in normally just a late starter yeah a late starter and he was always very attractive like you can see as a foal like he's very and um, very pretty very sharp looking he was tiny you know he was 15 too and um, as I said I was hoping to breed something a bit smaller but actually as life has gone on now that is kind of a niche that I like to sit in is that 15 to mark because they are so saleable and, and I was going to ask you like is size does size matter you know so size so in in context the people who actually bought on re bought Rodney and we'll they came back to me looking for an on re but I didn't have a 15 two version but I said I actually have a 17 hands slash 17 one version and they said oh a bit bigger than we were hoping they wanted another 15 two version but because as I said I could prove that I could stand over the temperament and that that he had so many redeeming qualities both of them that now Rodney, anybody listening that we haven't introduced right. already is your around the world horse. Around okay. the world, so, the draft, yeah. the black draft yeah. horse that we'll get to, I think. But yes, yes well, um, yeah. but as you can see from the pictures, so, um, you know, he really progressed from a four-year-old. I actually did very little with him as a four-year-old. We broke him, had him riding at home, like gone training. Um, 
but nothing major. There was still a, a war, so to speak. There was a war about whether or not this horse was going to be whatever and I thought he was war, going to be. Discussions. A discussion. Discussions. And then as a five-year-old, there was a, oh, actually, this horse might turn into something. Um, and I suppose that we've mentioned it before as well, that time is a luxury and um, not everybody has that luxury. Whereas I am privileged that I would have a year or two. Not, I'm not going to keep them indefinitely, but I would maybe have a year or two that we could play around with because I think definitely with the sport horses, definitely with the drafts and the Connemaras, I think Hannah would agree, um, that year can make all the difference. It could really can. And as yeah. you can see, even in these images from a four to a five-year-old standing up in hand, and then even from the year, his five-year-old year. So we actually won in Balmoral, which is the top picture, which would have been in May. And he was third and second in Dublin. Um, so in that time frame, so what, May, June, July, August, so four months, you can see the difference in the production, but also say just his ridden work and how the feed and how he was riding really helped to develop his top line mm -hmm. so by his top line we mean kind of from just in front of the saddle on his wither to his pole and how that developed and you can kind of see the slant of his shoulder and how much more muscle he has built up on that top line but not just there then you can see behind the saddle as well so he's much more round of his backside and he's also engaging his hind end much more so he's coming up underneath so you can see his um, leg with the white sock is engaging it could just be the picture as well but you can just see that he's much stronger in himself so you can see that from that image he's really tracking up he's really using himself um, and how much he even kind of progressed and developed from Balmoral to Dublin um, and he was like that he was bred to be very blood he was bred to be very competitive he really jumped as well I actually didn't do a huge amount of jumping with him I did a bit at home and had fun and he's since go on gone on to do some workers with his new owner but um I kind of didn't have time so I just focused on the flash and really kind of establishing that and it really stood to him because although he was bred to jump and can jump and um, I had all the basics done on the flash as well which really set him up for when he became stronger and then went on to do the workers sorry there for a second now Philippa are you guys seeing you guys are definitely seeing the screen I can't understand some people are saying that they're they're still see, seeing hands but both, oh, you, can both see, of you are seeing the correct screen share I can see yeah I can yeah. see Henri yeah. yeah same as me yeah okay grand Okay, hopefully. I think, hopefully what I, I, think what I'm gonna, I think what I'm going to do is I'm just going to come out of the screen share just for a second. No problem. Back and reshare. Reshare, just to be sure, to be sure that we're doing the best favour for everybody. No problem. There's any glitch on that end. And I'll come back out of that for a second. Talk away there for a second. No, but yeah, no, that's, that's Henri and I was very, you know, very happy I was very happy to be able to say no kind of our I think we went to Newmarket and Fergus was his first show and his second show was Balmoral and it was very emotional because I was able to say that I bred him I had you know produced him with my dad and my brother and then he'd gone on to win you know his first big class um, and you know he liked that he went out on Sunday and he won two classes and a championship I think and qualified got two tickets for the Royal International Horse Show at Hickstead in July so he's still in England competing, winning, has been to Hoy's, has been to Royal International, has gone on and is carrying on my prefix, which is great as well. And um, because there's a couple of them competing in England now with my prefix. And when you have that little bit of exposure, people do kind of start to associate well, I've kind of, I think particularly these couple of smaller horses, people are always like, oh, she generally has a nice small hunter. Maybe I'll see, does she have one at the moment? And people might then reach out to you and see, oh, do you have a small hunter for sale? So just for anyone who wouldn't know, a small hunter is, as I said earlier, when I'm talking about polar bears, kind of like a mini middleweight. So they're kind of 14.2 to 15.2, but generally they'd be at the end of that spectrum. So they would be 15.2 um, with a little bit of limb and a good step. Um, they're like, just the kind of like a, that's the, a market that I would have and there's a big market in the UK for that type of horse definitely so and it's very difficult to get that type of horse yeah. and that's like I would be like Philippa I would love a really nice 15-2 horse because they're so hard to come by and obviously anything that is rare is wonderful <laughs> and valuable yes, yes exactly valuable. yeah 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 
And, you know, Philippa, like you said, you know, that you're able to give them time and you're able to give yourself time and them time. And, you know, at the same time that you have your eye on the prize as far as, you know, trying to reach a sales point as well. But, you know, as we all know, time is money as well. It's investment. It's, it's you know, it's it's more farrier visits. It's more feed. It's more competition outings. It's, you know, more. And if you have a nice one, so, Wendy, I think it will pay off. You know, if you have a nice one. Yeah. that's the, it's the investment will pay off now it doesn't necessarily always happen like there's other horses that we flipped in a much shorter time frame that we, I will discuss later on as well so it, it it just depends you know this was a little bit of a luxury and it was a homebred and it was a bit of sentiment attached to the horse and to the sale and I wanted to, I wanted to do him justice like I think that that's really important as well is I would avoid at all costs going out under prepared so all of your homework, as you've emphasized with Hannah as well, is done at home or is done by trying to get out to some smaller shows or mm-hmm. going schooling. I don't know. You know, my brother's been taking his young horse out to Claire Morris to trot around the little cross country show jumping track there and get her out and about before Balmoral. There's, mm-hmm. um, you know, any amount of little shows around us that Hannah would go to as well that we kind of go or we'd go and I'd go up for a dressage lesson to Simone Hessian and I'd bring them up just to get them out and away from home. Um, and do things like that and even I've brought my cob that I have for this season I've brought him up to Meath to do a bit of riding on him because we're busy with the racehorses up here so and dad was away and doing bits so I've brought him up for a few weeks to get him going and like that I'm trying to get him out to kind of another arena down the road that friends have or I might get him out to a little cross country course down the road as well before he goes home so that he has all of those boxes checked and at least then as Hannah said as well when I'm selling him on hopefully later in the season I'll have evidence and I'll be sure to record it <laughs> of him doing all <laughs> of those all of those little things so Mm-hmm. yeah and just while I think to ask it as well too you know I I I know I be, I believe your father is an advocate of lunging um you know how much of that happens at home as well too a lot. yeah a lot a lot of lunging um I think for their balance balance their strength muscle development and we would be quite old-fashioned I know a lot of people um use kind of the Pessoa and there's different kind of new bungee things that you can use and yes they're great and you can use those as well but we kind of be more old-fashioned even if I know I've often got questions about feeding as well looking at the pictures here of say of the the transformation what do you feed what supplements are you giving we're bog standard nuts beet pulp chaff lots of hay and might throw in a scoop of blue chip or one of the builders you know kind of leading up to show season if something's a bit weak um seaweed carn oil run of the mill nothing nothing extravagant in any way no magic tricks no and they get and they get out they get out they get turn out for their head feed plenty of feed like I think one of my some of my renting friends came to my house one weekend and they couldn't get over the buckets of feed dad was giving but that's just the way that we do and then the the work counterbalances that and the fact that they get out counterbalances that and then as I said lunging we do side reins roller um just establishing balance establishing their own rhythm it's really important mm-hmm. there's a question in here um and, and there's a couple of questions in here but we'll come back to some of them at a later okay. point because they'll fit with some of the other conversation but for somebody that's looking for a 15 two, and look at you can approach this in your own way right but for somebody looking for a 15 two, uh like you speak of what's a realistic budget for such a horse and like that's like a difficult question because that's there's a lot of different one. There's a lot of different parts. variables. There's lots like, of variables to that. Yeah. I mean, do they want to buy a three year old in the field or do they want one that's up and running, one that has won already? Like, how long is a piece of string, really? Yeah. Yeah. That's not, that's not, you can definitely, if they want to, I don't know, contact someone afterwards, Wendy or something, but it, that's a little bit, there's too many variables to be able to say even on that kind of thing. And if you want something, as Hannah said, up and running, or do you want something? green as grass out of the field that they're very different horses yeah absolutely yeah. and as you've said you know you get what you put in you you will pay for the one that all the correct work has got into and, and i think that the producer deserves to get paid for the work they've put in but likewise you know you'll get one a lot cheaper in the field but you have to be willing to put in that work and the time the time yeah. is a big thing yeah so now we're moving on to connemara and this is back to you philippa um so Hi. 
Fun and my hand mittens. You didn't make it easy for me, did you? No. <laughs> what a name. Carrick won my home mittens. Yeah, no. And I she's Claire because she's Claire from Clare Island. So um I was very privileged. We had her full brother, who was the complete opposite of her. She is 14 to button of a grey mare and he was 15 hands and roan and a leg in every corner and I think Hannah probably remembers him I was lucky enough to win the ridden championship in the RDS on him as a four and five year old I do and remember then, him Philippa yeah, because I'm um, second <laughs> but, oh sorry yeah remember and um and he was Robin and we so as I mentioned earlier with um my mum um, she's very involved with my brother and I um, buying and selling ponies when we were younger and dad also but mum kind of started this Connemara venture so to speak with us um, and we kind of went the first year to Clifton and told dad we'd buy one or two and I think we came home with five and it went from there um, but we've been very successful with it I think I think we have we actually we have we've been very we've had lovely cut up some nice ponies for a, for a small collection of ponies that we bought out of the sales we've been very lucky with them um, and they've gone on to compete. Why, why do you um, think that is, Philippa? Like, what are your, you know, when you go to look for these, like, what, what are, you, what are the key things that you're looking for? What are the first things that you look to? The second thing, like, are there a couple of key things that? And this is not asking you to give like your yeah, trades. Yeah, no, no. Or, I think know, there's something to be said for substance in the Connemara pony now, which doesn't always come through. So I know my brother and I go to the sales now and one of the big things we're looking for is limb so we're looking for bone a little bit of substance to the pony and um, we like to look at the breeding obviously as well but it actually it doesn't impact our decision as much as like we have a very good friend who comes with us to the sales and sometimes she's shocked because something just comes into the ring and we go she does, before she realizes that my brother has a bot you know and she, did you buy that and you're like yeah we bought that <laughs> it's kind of just we kind of come in and have give each other a nod and we have to like there has to be a bit of presence to it a bit of substance to it you know try and see it move if you can um have a look at the breeding see is there breeding that you don't like breeding that you do like performance breeding flat breeding that's across the board you know when you're talking about Connemara's you're talking about sport horses or thoroughbreds or whatever it is you know there's kind of those key principles or key ro- rules apply to all and um, so because we liked her brother so much and um, we actually we bought him in Clifton sales but we made contact with the breeder and went out to Clare Island and had a very magical day actually and um, visiting Sean O'Grady to and bought her and we didn't particularly like her as a foal but we had made the venture to Clare Island and she's very sentimental um, to us and as you can see, I was lucky enough then to win um, at the RDS on her. And she was third in Clifton as well. She was the highest placed mare that year as a five-year-old. And we decided what are, then... What are her best qualities? And why, why did she do as well as she did? Her temperament, again, keeps coming back to temperament. Anybody could ride her. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that class in Dublin that year was carnage. There was, I don't know, 29 Connemara, white Connemara ponies. I don't even know there was there a bay. There probably was a bay one, but there was a lot of white Connemara ponies. Mm-hmm. And people started talking after the class. And I think it was unbeknownst to my, myself that apparently I wore my Sam Shield hat to make myself stand out. I, I didn't was, really I realize. Just down here. How do you stand out from the crowd? <laughs> I didn't really realize, but I probably didn't. It probably did help because it's still smart and people do wear it on the flat. But I wore my Sam Shield hat and it probably did help make me stand out a little bit. But in my heart of hearts, I think that she did a set foot perfect show piece that year. And she's not perfect either. She stands under herself a little bit. For me, she'd be a little bit lighter bone for a Connie mare but she's pretty. She moves very well. She's true to type and her kind of, she's got good confirmation kind of her shoulder top line. She, in relation to that, she ticks a lot of boxes and she went out and I was pulled top, which I think is the most horrible place to be because there's only one place you can go, go down. So I much prefer to be pulled third or fourth and go up than be pulled top and try and stay top. Um, but she went out and she stood and I was pulled out in front of them. And I'll never forget it because I pulled out in front of them all and tw- all 29 ponies to do their showpiece. And then when I pulled out from the line, it's that moment where will they, won't they stand and what's going to happen, especially in Dublin, because the, there's so much atmosphere. atmosphere. 
And while I was standing in front of all of the other ponies, a couple of the competitors had to clarify the showpiece. And I was like, oh no, I was like, is, is she going to stand? I was like, I was tormented. I was like, please stand, please stand. And then she did. And she went out and she just, it, I was probably the, one of the best show pieces I ever did. She was just on the button. But like you said, that all comes back into the work that I've done at home but with her. But surely, Philippa, like this showing crack, I mean, sure, all you have to do is go in and do a bit of a walk and a bit of a trot and a bit of a canter. Sure, isn't that it? Like, and they just have to start. Isn't that all? That's it, Wendy. Yeah, it's pretty yeah. much simple as, yeah, yeah, no. So what is it that, like, what is it in the work that you guys do? Like, the two of you are masters at this, in fairness. So what is it about the preparation that you guys put in that turns them around to be the performers that they are on the day in that atmosphere and all the rest of it? Well, I, I just as, like to say with the flat work side of things, and I know Hannah definitely has actively gone to try and get help with this, and so have I. So it's not being afraid to go out and get help from other people in different disciplines, different professions, different backgrounds, whether it's dressage, show jumping, eventing, getting lessons, going to clinics, getting the ponies out and about as much as possible, and then applying that when you come home. So when I'm in the show ring, it's not just trotting around looking, well, I hope it's not just trotting around looking pretty. I have to be able to ride my young ponies in particular. So that comes from a basis with my mum and dad who would have done a lot of eventing. And um, they both would have entered to kind of three-star level anyway, and both would have represented on teams. So all of their basics um, were, very, my basics were very grounded. So all of our lateral work, so whether it's shoulder four, shoulder in, leg yielding, our transitions that was drilled into us from a young age so now it enables me that if a pony is spooking at something down the long side I can do a little bit of shoulder four I can come away from the track and I can leg yield back out onto the track and make it all look very smooth and the transitions look very good because I have all of that grounding and people might not necessarily realize that that's actually what's happening. But I, I think ring craft comes into it as well, especially in showing, being able to ride your ring, to find your place, not cut people off, not to be circling all of the time. You don't want to be too in the judges' faces either. You want to ride your ring, ride for your space. And I always say, and I think it's because it's probably been drilled into me so, since a young age, the first and last thing that the judge sees is your walk. So when you walk into the ring, that's the first thing, whether it's in hand, whether it's in whether it's in a ridden class on a draft, Conor Mara, it doesn't matter what discipline it's in in relation to that. The first and last thing they see is your walk. And that just sets the tone for everything else to come as well. And I suppose like I'm thinking, Hannah, you know, just across like the animals that you've kind of brought to the table here this evening as well. And, you know, the versatility that you're showing across all of them, like, you know, the the the, the flat work piece, you know, how that lends back into your your prep for your show jumping. It yeah. lends back into your eventing and then you're able to go out and do your dress size. Like it's not, you know, it, it's across the board. It allows you then to act. Yeah be versatile in the other spheres as well absolutely yeah and I think there's a bit of like outside of dressage and eventing there's this fear around dressage mm. you know people think god I could never do that and like a bad word <laughs> yeah very dangerous you know definitely don't say that yeah. dressage is just flat work and 90 percent of your riding is flat work like riding from number one to number two like it's flat work they 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 only jump the two fences. They have, you know, maybe 30 strides in between. That's your flat work. Mm -hmm. And if they can't ride forward and straight and you can't adjust them, but then it's going to be really difficult to jump a clear round. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think you were saying as well about like how, I guess, do you get the best out of them in the ring? For me, and I know I absolutely wreck everybody's head at home about this, is, but it's really trying to work out like what makes the pony tick. So mm -hmm. tack, bridle, bit, saddle feed how much turnout like I would stay awake at night thinking about this stuff but I really find that when you get all that stuff right then you can concentrate on making everything else better and I'm guessing I'm guessing that you don't just take out the good tack on the show day like to put the new stuff on on the show day it's used on the training yeah. days as well yeah. like yeah how, how could you expect that your horse will perform well when he is a totally different saddle on you don't know if he's comfortable in the balance could be totally different for you and him like 
my horses get ridden in the same bridle and saddle at home as they do at the show, and I'm sure that Philip is the same. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And another question that, that came in here earlier on, and I maybe put it to you as now, um, is um, somebody was asking about what your thoughts are about matching children with the ponies that you're selling. Um, I think it's really important, but it can be really difficult. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you have people messaging you for a pony and you're like praying, you know, that they won't buy it. And you're trying your best to put them off, mm -hmm. which can be difficult because you yeah. don't want to knock your own animal. It's maybe not mm -hmm. a fault of their own animal. And also you don't want to knock their jockey because it might not be a fault of their jockey, but they might just not be a good match. Mm -hmm. um, I think like as much as you can try to do that, you should. Mm -hmm. But also as long as you're totally honest about what you are selling, it's mm -hmm. up to them whether they take your advice or not. Mm -hmm. Because people are yeah. going to do their own thing at the end of the day. Yeah, I, think I echo what Hannah says there, but honestly, really, that's it's up there. It's their decision at the end of the day. You have to be honest and cover yourself. Mm -hmm. And once you're covered and you can stand over what you've said, then that's that's the end of it. Mm -hmm. Another question that's come in here, and I'll throw it to you now as well, too, is um, when would you start the process for a written prospect when aiming for the likes of the big venues like Dublin or Balmoral or what, whatever? You know, when you're aiming for the written classes, when are you actually starting that that journey? How far in advance? It depends on the age of the animal, I suppose, and how much experience they'd have as well. So the four, likes of my four or five year old, four or five year old. So say the four year old cob I have now, I won't make Balmoral with him, but that's more because I can only take a very limited number of days off as a teacher because unfortunately my holidays don't start till June. Oh, um, if if I'd had an extra day, I might have maybe tried to put the skates under myself a bit to get him a bit more organised. But actually, a lot of that comes back to their temperament as well, Wendy. So if they have the mindset for it and like I think he does, I think he is going to have it. So I would have kicked on to try and get him ready. Whereas now I'm actually taking the foot off a little bit. He'll probably have a few down weeks now that I have him up and running and then it'll be all guns blazing in the next kind of couple of weeks. So you could say anywhere between, say, kind of training and backing a, a three year old late awesome having a break over Christmas and coming back in January February March and kind of going from there and um, whereas then the likes of my racehorse riding horse he's only coming back into things now and it'll take him a little bit longer so that just yeah. it just depends on what your aims for the season are as well I think for if you're aiming a four-year-old we'll say a four-year-old Connie at the four and five-year-old class I suppose first of all not every four-year-old will be ready for it um, and there's just nothing you can do about that you can't pass forward time uh, in an ideal world, you'd probably be back in them, you know, late, like autumn time kind of and have them ready. And as Philip has said, give them a break. But saying that if they've always been really well handled and really well looked after all their life, sometimes it doesn't take as long, particularly if you know their um, temperament. I'm thinking about one that we had um, and the entries were open for Balmoral. And as everybody knows with Balmoral, the Connemaras fill up like within minutes. And Lean said to enter this pony. And I said, she's not back yet, Lean. And he was like, she'll be fine. I know her temperament. You know, Joan has done a fabulous job handling her since she was a foal. She's an absolute lady. She'll be fine. So I thought he was crazy, but I injured her anyway. But actually, she went to Balmoral and she, she brought home a rosette. So, yeah, uh, I think we but, but that wouldn't be my aim. That I'd much rather <laughs> have a lot more. I think I had fun. eight weeks before Dublin one year with a Connemara pony, and I ended up second. But like that, it was an ordeal. And I think the poor pony slept for the rest of the week as well. And it was for owners. So it was like it was and, and brilliant. You're experienced as well, too, and having done yes. it. Yeah, all it's all not. So I would you'd, it's not ideal. It can be done, but you wouldn't be I wouldn't be endorsing it. No, no absolutely. Yeah. Before we leave Mittens here, what I think yeah. of it, um, she bred this. Yeah. So we first fall on foot there. Uh, and um, that's by uh, Cashway Rocket, another Connemara pony that I was lucky enough to ride and win on in Clifton and things and has gone on to be very prolific. So we didn't catch her last year. We just left it a bit late. So hoping to put her in foal again early this year, but we're very happy with her first progeny, as you can see again, leg in every corner, bit of presence, lovely kind of outlook to it. Um, and she really moves as well. So really hoping that we might have something a little bit exciting, but you never know. Sure, there We'll have to wait and see. As we said, it's a waiting game now for three years anyway. So we'll have to see what we have. Yeah, okay. So coming back to you then, um, Hannah, uh, maybe talk to us about this this one here. 
So this was Bracker Dream or Dreamer. Um, he was a super, super pony for me. So he was by Black Shadow. So I mentioned Black Shadow earlier. He was the first pony. He really was the one that kind of ignited my love of working hunters because he was just so brave cross country. Like I would be praying that the courses would be really difficult and hard and horrible because I always knew Shadow would go around um, and other ponies wouldn't. So Dreamer, um, I think Lean Bottom has a two-year-old. So the picture on the top left-hand side is him as a three-year-old. So you can see he was very raw um, and not perfect, as we've said. You know, none of them are perfect. But we give him a loose jump and he was very like his father. He loved jump and he would look for the fence. He was super brave. So he was broken. That would have been um, that would have been autumn time. So he he's clipped there. So dad would have been breaking him at that stage and then the picture in the middle of the screen is him in at the Northern Ireland Festival in Cavan in April so that's just what like five or six months later and you can already see how much his shape and outline has changed his front looks much better he's starting to you know build a bum behind his shoulder has more definition um and what I loved about him that day is he ended up jumping a class bigger than what we had aimed for because we were quite busy but I guess like always you know it was either me or dad that had ridden him and he just he really trusted what you asked him to do so even though the course was big I remember coming out and saying to Liam, you know sometimes he came around the corner and you could feel him being like oh really you know you want me to jump that and I'd be like yeah and he'd be like okay so you know and he just got on with it he was super um so then I think going around to the top right hand corner that was him as a five-year-old so he did a couple of unaffiliated, unaffiliated events that was in Strad Valley um, mm -hmm. And then you have Balmoral on the left hand side, Mullingar in the middle and Dublin qualifiers uh, in Rincula and then the final in Lambertstown. Mm -hmm. um, and he just he was super. Everything you asked him to do, he would do. He nearly always brought home a rosette for me. Um, was so enjoyable, like just so, so enjoyable. Um, mm -hmm. Liam, if he, his kids wanted to go for a hack, Liam could tack him up and bring him with them. And like that, we hunted them, did show jumping, did workers, did absolutely everything. And I don't know which video you want to start with. Uh, so this is Dreamer. Wait, wait, you want me to start with this one? Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Um, so I, the other video, yeah. So yeah. as I said, I was second to Philippa in Dublin with him. Um, so he wouldn't have been a perfect ridden pony. Um, but he did a, a really super show that day. So I think that brought him up. This is him jumping around Balmoral and he was just put perfect. He had the highest jump mark on the day. And I mean, like it was so, so much fun jumping around that day. And Black Shadow had actually got injured on the way to Balmoral. And I came out of the ring with tears in my eyes because I was like, look how good Dreamer stepped up for me. You know, he, he like was a joy. And as I said, I did everything with him. There he is, you know, doing just a little bit of show jumping. That was his first show back that year. So we just kept the fences small, but again, could do anything. Here he is as a five-year-old at the Stepping Stones to Success in Wexford. So like for selling him, that would be a flat work video that I'd use because not only are you showing flat work, but you're showing that he can do it in public, that, you know, it doesn't need to be at home where it's super quiet and he's really confident that he can go out and do it. What's going on here? Here is a handling video. So here's Dreamer with no head colour on him being clipped. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so if that doesn't show temperament and that he's quiet to handle, then I don't know what does. Um, there he is riding on the beach. And I suppose like these all rounders, you don't know where they'll take you. Like their Dreamer is being videoed for a programme on RTE1, you know, mm -hmm. so they can bring you anywhere. Um, just if you kind of give them the opportunity. Um, I'll just interlude for a second. Somebody's asking about slides being stuck. Slides are not stuck. So if anybody's in trouble out there, just log out and log back in again, I think is the thing to do because we're, we're we're doing okay at this end, yeah? Yeah. Okay. Um, so Dreamer was sold, um, I'm trying to think, was it early last year? And he went to America. So he went to a little girl who had lost her confidence with another pony. So the clip that's playing now is her just trotting over a fence uh, because that was all she was confident to do. And then the second clip there where she's cantering down, she's jumping a bigger fence. Um, that's a few months later. Um, and for me, like, that's like, yeah, it's obviously fantastic that he was sold and that he was worth more money because of all of the things that we did with him and because he was produced correctly but look at what he has done for that job like that gives me 
so much joy to see him doing that and we and she has joy on her own face as well that's what i was going to say we chat to these people regularly and they absolutely adore him they want to buy a second one because when the daughter eventually goes to college the mother won't have anything to ride um when they sent me that photo of him with the girl she said oh his rosette collection is bordering on embarrassing at this Mm -hmm. stage you know and i was saying god i you would be embarrassed about a lot worse things Mm -hmm. um and that's I'd like that. But, but the, no. the the marketing value that somebody like that has for you then as well, too. Yeah. And like incredible. she like speaking on TikTok. So that girl puts up loads of videos on TikTok. <laughs> and I, I clicked onto the hashtag Dury Ronan Stud because she had and there was like 1.6 million views. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah (laughs) but they're invaluable and we had one like that Hannah I don't know do you remember him Houston he was a full brother to Ted Benny Leah and he went to Austria another Connemara pony that we bought from we bought his full brother from the Clifton sales but went back to the breeder again like that and he went to Austria and he was doing like FEI classes and things and once she she was barely able to trot him over a fence when she came to try him in Ireland. And then she went on to the FEI classes and she now is an adult, but is a very petite adult and has mm-hmm. kept him as now competing him in horse classes. Cause that's mm-hmm. how much she loves him. And like, you can't, they're, they're mm-hmm. just they They are a dream, no more than dreamer, but they are a dream to have. Yeah. And just while it enters my head as well too, cause I know we discussed this before, but you know, like the, 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 the genuineness I suppose as well of how you how you relay what you have to and what yeah. you're trying to sell and like you know dreamer, where they're at yeah like that girl and her mother like said it again recently um she, dreamer was bought through an agent and the agent almost didn't sell it to them um because I said and it was true and it still is true to this day and Philip had seen him you know when he went into the pocket he would jog and you'd think that he was all business and he you know would like throw like a little buck maybe when he went into canter the first time but there was absolutely no dirtiness in it he just would be so excited to be out like you'd go places and people would say would he was he a stallion because he was all presence and all action mm-hmm. um so the the agent was a bit worried that that little girl wouldn't manage him but mm-hmm. because I guess that we were so honest and we said that that was the way he was, but also because he was so genuine, you know, there was nothing behind it. Like she loves that now and she rides him bareback and she has videos of him hopping around in her bareback and it's lovely. Um, But I think you have to be honest because if he arrived over there and did that and I had said, oh no, he's perfect and he never puts a foot out of place, it would have been a different story entirely. It's expectation versus reality sometimes. Yeah, and it's also like once they knew that they knew how to deal with that, yeah. you know, I said, oh, I do this. And they were like, OK, that's fine then, you mm-hmm. know. Mm-hmm. But you you also want to stand over what you said as well. Like you want you want yeah. repeat custom down the road, yeah. whether it's direct yeah. from there or whether it's from the word of mouth, yeah. mouth or the shares elsewhere. You want happy customers. And you want happy customers. And for me, you want happy horses. You want them to go to the right home. Mm-hmm. So coming on then to um, the drafts, uh, Philippa. Um, yeah. So this is just the first little one. So um, he didn't, I don't don't even know what he named. So I named him SCT Master of the Hounds. Um, I bought him from friends of ours in Galway who he had hunted him as a three and four year old. So um, we called him Paddy. He was by Castigar, rebel out of Crano, Crano Hero Man. Crano, Crano Hero Mare. And um it's the same story, another little small hunter. So 15 2, as you can see, a leg in every corner, lovely shoulder, a little bit of presence, um, maybe slightly dipped of his back. So that's yeah. probably one where we could fault him, but he was clean limbed, lovely kind of round. That was kind of earlier on the season. So he developed even more from that picture um, to the Dublin pictures, I suppose. And he's pictured after being, he was a blue boy that week in Dublin. He was um, second in the performance Irish draft with my brother Christopher. He jumped the only clear round. So Christopher always says that nobody remembers second, but I didn't think we were going too badly <laughs> that week. We were second in the performance Irish draft and he was second in the small hunters with me, the four and five year old small hunters. And what I thought was really nice that day in Dublin was it was the same ride judge for the performance Irish drafts and the small hunters. And when I presented the horse to the judge, he looked at him and he said, I think I've ridden this little horse already today, have I? And I said, yes, sir, you rode him this morning. Because, and for that, I think the true kind of 
hunt, hunting hunter type should be able to do that. And I think it proved that that's exactly what he was. And I remember in Dublin just being able to sit on him and ride around that ring. I don't think now I've I always have lovely rides in Dublin. I'm very I've been very privileged that I, I don't enjoy doing it if I can't enjoy myself. That sounds it's a bit of a, par- a paradox, but I have to feel that they'll go in and they'll stand in the middle of the ring that they'll behave themselves going around the outside, that it doesn't always happen. Definitely doesn't always happen. I <laughs> definitely doesn't always happen. But I try and have it that we can go in confidently and that's the case. Mm-hmm. And I just remember literally being able to have a smile on my face the whole time I went around that ring on him because he just was enjoying it and I was enjoying it. Um, and yeah, like that, I had him in the yard I don't know, a week or two, and somebody had a social media post up saying, looking for a top class small hunter for an amateur jockey. And I said, this is what he's going to be. And they panicked because I wanted the ride for Dublin on him. And then obviously turns out that Christopher qualified him for the performance drafts too. So we wanted to keep that as well for Christopher. Mm -hmm. Um, And I said, look, you can have him, but we want him for Dublin, which I wouldn't always do. Mm-hmm. Um, and she said no problem she was worried I think we we're going to sell him if he did well in Dublin that we would have tried to sell him out from under her but yeah. I priced him I said this to them and I remember saying it to them I priced him at that point that he I knew I knew what my price was going to be after Dublin regardless mm-hmm. of how well he did and I priced him at that going so mm-hmm. he was actually sold before we even went to Dublin mm-hmm. um, which is a bit risky but it was it's also our shop window and we've often discussed that you know, mm-hmm. those bigger county shows, um, they are our shop windows where there are people over from England. They are looking, they are, we're presenting our horses to win prizes. And that's good for our reputation, for Tim, Tim Scott's reputation, Derry Land's reputation, Hannah Gordon's reputation. You know, it all builds on that. So when you know you have a nice one, it's very hard to let them go before the big event. Um, but yeah, very easy, very straightforward little horse. Another one I'd want 10 of tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And um, sorry, I was distracted just looking at the questions across here. <laughs> I'm trying to do, I'm trying to think. Multitasking. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, I suppose what I was going to say here is, you know, like, obviously, you know, talking to, you know, we've had the conversation about the importance of the temperament, the character, the rideability, all that side of it. We've also had the conversation about, you know, them being nice movers and, you know reasonably correct and you know the soundness bit is important as well too the longevity bit is important as well too but the jump and you know how how much how much jump or is it like is having the jump is it a bonus or is it like a necessary or what what's I don't the- think I that I don't think that horse has jumped a fence since he left Dublin Horse Show I don't know, but I don't think he has because he's competing on the flat in England. I might be mistaken, but as far as I'm aware, he hasn't jumped a stick since he left. Mm-hmm. So the last round of fences he ever jumped was in the RDS draft performance class. Um, and I think he's probably very happy. He hunted as a three and four year old. Um, they might have done some fun jumping with him, you know, like little cross country fences and things like that. But he hasn't competed as a working hunter in England. Um, so I think it's as we said earlier, you're breeding and you're hoping that you have a jump. How much jump is going to be a variable, I suppose. You can do a lot with a limited jump. You don't need to jump 145. You can do a lot with 90 and a metre and a metre 10 max. I don't think I'd jump bigger than a metre 10 now. If I'd probably eat it before I jump it now. Um, But I definitely think that there's a lot to be said for that middle of the road kind of horse that's not going to be too exuberant too extravagant you know I think Hannah would agree with me um, yeah I think if you have a nice model with really good temperament and he moves good enough I think you have a market for him all day long Mm -hmm. so like I love a jumper I mean I love jumping I love workers that would always be my preference um but if it if it's not a wonderful jumper, I don't think it's in for it. I don't think that doesn't mean that you won't get paid for it. And I don't think that doesn't mean that you shouldn't put the work in. Mm-hmm. I actually, in some ways, it's almost more important that you put the correct basis in because of the clientele that will be buying them. Mm-hmm. Um, but I genuinely think that if you have the other things, a jump is only a bonus. Mm-hmm. And in a way, it might not add a huge amount of value on, depending on your clientele. Like sometimes with the Connemara's, 
like you know you get your three-year-old and you're getting them ready for the sales and you back them and stuff like the jump is almost irrelevant yeah I'll put fidget something jumping in but the good jumper might not necessarily make more money than the very average jumper because you know if they ride similar if they're similar types and everything else a lot of the people that are buying on Clifton and online they're not they don't want to jump Grand Prix they want a horse that they can go out and do a little bit of everything with and most of them like would they they might have entered 80 90 a meter you know and I do think an average jumper produced correctly will jump a meter Mm -hmm. all day with probably any jockey and just as a kind of just to acknowledge to people, I do appreciate that we are over the time of an hour, but I think <laughs> I think it is of value to to capture this conversation um for the recording and all the rest of it. So I am going to let this conversation run its course. We're so try and speed it, up it, it, a bit now, Andy. My no, I am I am I'm, I'm this is this is the last let's talk equine until the autumn. So we are going to get the the, the conversation recorded. So people we should continue talk. boring a few people here for the evening people can tune out and come back to the recording if they wish but we're going to keep this going okay so um one of the questions here is would you be concerned about overworking young horses or ponies or where or how would you determine what's too much hard question yeah i think you're a lot of the time you'll know like like there will be you'll be pick up on your animal's ability your animal's tolerance your animals kind of day to day grind, I suppose. Um, they'll tell you, they will tell you, they will go off their feed. They'll throw in a little narky buck if they're doing too much. Now that might necessarily be, there might be something else going on. Like Hannah said, ill fitting tack or saddle or bishing. Um, we do little and often with our young horses. I think that's kind of, you know, a lot of lunging, as you said, like my father likes to do a lot of lunging. Um, a lot of hacking we do a lot of varied work to try and keep the younger horses sweet and I think that's really important as well and the ponies so lots of hacking little bits across country going different places and you know I'll pick this moving in pardon days off days off off. yeah let them out the field turn out you know let them be ponies let them be horses having breaks you know say if you've backed a horse and you've done a few weeks with it and you feel okay it's got its basics I'm going to give it a break now that horse that comes back after those few weeks will be a completely different horse they'll have had time to absorb everything that they've learned they'll have time to process it to mature to strengthen a little bit of spring grass like you won't know you'll have something completely different underneath you so I think it's like even it's, kids going to school, they get Saturdays, definitely. Sundays off, yeah, they get midterms, exactly. they get summer holidays. Yeah, it's yeah, the same yeah. 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 If you had to go into work seven days a week, like you wouldn't be very happy about it. Productivity you just goes. Yeah. 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 And like, as Philip said, they do tell you, like you find with your four year old when you're riding them, they get to a point where they're kind of aren't improving. They're stuck where they're at. Their brain has just taken in as much as it can and, and it needs a break. And, Bigger horses probably need more breaks and more time, but not to kind of underestimate how important the break is. Um, yeah. And mm-hmm. even as Philip said, to vary it, to get a little bit of a hacking and, and just get some different mm-hmm. different outings under the rail, just keep them interested. There's another question in here. Um, do you find there's good market for the smaller draft, the 15 yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, very desirable. Continent, UK, it it has to I still think that there's still a basis that there has to be a decent step good temperament and decent confirmation there mm-hmm. um but yes do you think, do you think with the drafts that there's um you know that the I suppose the like we're talking mares or you know like they, they haven't had them inspected having them having conformity to breed type or what's expected as as, as breed. do you think that that has a um a relevance and importance it does uh for the uk market it does because for the draft society in the uk if you want to show under their rules the the mares have to be classified so yeah. say yeah. I would have had an issue so with um with Rodney who's pictured here Ashtree our diamond his mm. dam wasn't um hadn't been brought to inspections mm. um but I was very luckily I we had been in contact with the breeder and he had said that he was thinking about presenting for the the inspections and I said oh please do because it means that I will have more of a market for Rodney because Rodney would have been able to place in his class 
but he wouldn't have been entitled to place in the Supreme, say, if he'd gone on and been, been you know, been brought forward to the championship. Um, so I don't know, do people get hugely hung up on it? Or people yeah. might be slightly um, oblivious um, to some of it. Yeah. But yeah. it was only because it was brought to my attention in relation to him yeah. in particular. Uh, I think you know, it was on, brought to yeah. my attention by Philippa because of Rodney. So I think we were talking about it. Mm -hmm. And I noticed myself that if I, you know, if you're looking at something for sale on Facebook, the first thing I do is look to see if the dam was. And if she wasn't, is it, you know, in a way almost worth buying that horse because you're, you're, definitely you're selling gula smaller than it would be with one yeah. and, i and don't another, know sorry sorry no, i was just going to say like another question kind of to sort of sandwich with that as well too is you know the whole kind of scenario at the moment where some people are looking at you know the cost of registrations and one passport versus another and the 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 non-pedigree passport versus the pedigree passport sudbook passports you know in your opinion, like even for this level in the market, is this something that, you know, deserves a bit of cognizance at the outset with breeders as well? Mm -hmm. I think um, it's a hard question to answer in, in the current climate. Uh, yeah, I, pre I appreciate that. But when, you, when you think about yeah. your end. But I, I do think about the that the class people love buying a green passport. Yeah, they like the to think that they're buying an Irish yeah. horse with Irish breeding, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And then, like, I would have loved to have a green book for Polar Bear, but actually for the classes that he was doing, it made no difference. Do you know, do you know what I mean? Like, he had a white book, and for the classes that he was doing, it was of no consequence to him at all. So I think it's very dependent on the breed type as well and what you want to do with them down the road. So, yeah, yeah I think that's... Yeah. Now, I'm going to throw another one in here quickly before we leave the pony side. I know we've left the ponies, but before we really leave the ponies, oh, right. side, back to Sweetich, right? Prevalent. Mm -hmm. Well, it's it's in reference to both the, the Connies and the drafts. Yeah. Um, somebody saying they've had a few in recent years. And of course, that's disappointing when you put in the time, the effort. And um, what, do you, <laughs> what do you recommend for these horses and ponies? Now the question goes on to say, is there a country that is that is their market that don't have the midgy? <laughs> it's difficult. So, it is yeah. difficult. It's something that needs to be very well managed, definitely. Um, um I think that well, in my experience, we've had ponies, like I have a pony, and in a certain field that has certain bushes, she looks like she has sweet itch. And in any other field that doesn't have that particular type, she doesn't have any itch at all. Um, and again, I think if you were honest when you were selling that pony and you said, look, at, I don't know what the bush is called, but I would find out <laughs> if I was deciding to sell her. If you can keep her away from this bush, you'd be fine. But if you put her in a field with those, you know, she's going to itch. Yeah. Um, I think if it was a, a top class performance pony or something as well, people might be more forgiving of it. Um, so if it's something that's going to go out and do the job or jump, I don't know, a grade A 14 two track and it has sweetage and you're like, look, it's manageable. But this, you know, full disclosure, it comes with this. You'd probably be more inclined to forgive it. I'm not sure if Hannah would agree with that, but it's yeah, I, I think, think it's so. I think it's kind comment. of one of those things. Yeah, yeah. That's fair comment. So moving on now to Rodney. Yeah. Um, Rodney or uh, Ashtree R Diamond. Ashtree R Diamond. Yeah. Um, yeah. So very lucky to have bought him. The top left pictures there, just me when I fell in love in a field in Donegal um, off the Mulrain brothers. And what, then what have... did you fall in love with at that point, Philippa? What was it about him that, 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 that attracted oh, What's you? not to love? Look, just look at him, Wendy. Right. Just look at him. <laughs> um, but no, time? I think it was, oh, he just like his colour was so unusual for draft um he had personality um quality so that middle picture above is actually him as a two-year-old and when I showed everyone when I bought that's when I brought him home a few weeks and we had him out and I showed that to people and they were like oh it looks like a four-year-old sport horse yeah. like I look at that and I don't see draft whereas the other pictures you can see how much he developed into that draft yeah. Um, and even as that draft, then he was a real quality draft. You know, he had that he kind of had his ace of spades on his in on his four, you know, between his eyes. Um, he just had a leg in every corner. I mean, he's a black beauty. There's yeah, 
Yeah, he is. Like, he's one of those, he's out of a, a movie or out of a book, out of a story tale, you know, something like that. And he just was one of these characters and a personality to boot. And it was just one of those, we seem to always have these in our lives. I don't know if everybody's the same, but we have these little stories that happen around horses and that was just another story another tale to add to I went off with my friend Peter O'Donnell and the next thing my dad was away and I was looking for approval and I had to make a decision and we were traipsing around in the rain in Donegal and I just walked into this field and I just saw this horse and I said yeah I'll have him thanks love at first sight yeah and um, I was very lucky, got on very well with him. And then, as I said earlier, if people are still tuning in to us, um, the people who bought my little homebred horse, SCT Henri, off me came back at the kind of back end of last year. So he would have been a five year old. So I had him from two to five. Um, and they said, look, we're looking for another kind of small hunter, something very similar to Henri. Do you have anything? And I said, I don't have a 15-2 version, but I have a 17-1 version, if that's any good. Um, and it they bought them unseen from me. So taking my word for it, the videos that I sent, the pictures that I had, um, they said, oh, look, I said, look, you know, I can do X, Y and Z. And they said, no, we trust you. You know, we've dealt with you before. Um, and yeah, he's in a very happy home where he cub- went cubbing for most of the season and then whipped in with a pack of hounds in Cornwall and is going to his first show next weekend. So, but it's fair to say, happy life. Like in in the short time that you did, you know, exhibit him, you were very successful. With he was him. very successful as a ridden Irish draft and a heavyweight hunter. Um, yeah. unfortunately, I didn't get to Dublin because, unlike the one with when I had Paddy, the other draft horse, mm-hmm. I didn't want to run the risk of keeping him. It was a nice sum of money for me, and I just said, you know what, I don't want to. I just said I let him go, and I let him go before Dublin. And I was sorry to see him go before Dublin, but at yeah. the same time, it was the right decision. And so. tell me this, you know, the side saddle piece of it. It's not something that everybody has a talent for, or indeed the um tack for. <laughs> um, you know, how much does it influence? Or does it influence or does it have a part in adding to your marketplace or tell us that? Yeah, I think it would have an added value for me producing a show horse um, Mm -hmm. as an extra selling point. Because if that show horse can be produced as a side saddle horse, it's an an extra class that they can go in. They also generally have to have a very um, nice temperament and a certain pace. So their trot has to be quite low and quite even. Um, so to make it more elegant, to make it easier for you to sit to that trot. Um, so they have to, it really shows off their temperament. And I think there is kind of a big market to the UK for those ladies' horses. Um, it's kind of something that's been revived in the last, I don't know, 10 years anyway. And it kind of goes in waves that the size settle becomes very popular again. Um, and it's just something I've always done. So if I have something that there that's quiet and has a good temperament, and I enjoy doing it on, a, I'll throw them on it, you know, and have a bit of fun and enjoy it. And then I can take a little video or a picture and, it, you know, kind of promote the horse and promote the sport. And we remember as well. that you're a lady again. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and tell me this, you know, am I right or wrong in saying, was this guy purchased unseen? Purchased unseen from the UK. Yeah. Yeah. So I, yeah, they, they just trusted, they went with what I was saying based off what I had previously sold to them. So, and that was post COVID as well. So that's that's there. They were just saying, yeah, if he is what you say it said on the tin, then we're taking your word for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So back across, uh, bouncing back to Hannah. <laughs> yeah, see how I threw that in there now, Hannah. I think we're nearly I'm still, there. I'm, I'm still awake over here. We're nearly <laughs> there. Um, so Bala Bouncer. So this yep. is my unicorn I guess um he's owned by Lee Minsky and Derry Ronan Stud so he bought him as a foal um he went to see him and he seen him in the field and he said that's going to be my next stallion and I think the um the man that bred him thought he was a little bit crazy but he was proved correct um so you can see like from the top left hand side that was him as a year old so he won a lot of championships in hand for Liam as a young horse um and then I started riding him as a just rising four-year-old. So dad backed him. We mm-hmm. did a little bit of hunting with him and he like does absolutely everything. So as Philip has said earlier um, about the judge saying, what do you do? I do a bit of everything. Um, I had similar at a qualifier last year. This, she came out to look at his confirmation. She said, and what does he do? And I said, everything. And she was like, all oh, right. 
you know, what do you mean by that? And I was like, well, you know, uh, last week he was jumping the 115 in Ardcoon Equestrian Centre. And the week before that, he was at a, a dressage show and she was like, oh, right, he really does everything. And I was like, yeah. yeah. Everything. And I'm just after noticing, Hannah, that one of my lovely stars here has <laughs> <laughs> it did a leap. It should be here, but I suppose okay. it would make the point that making that bounce. Oh, bounce. silver oh, merit. Yes. Okay. Very good. I, I yeah. was wondering what the stars were. So yeah, there is gold gold merit for showing for himself. Yes. So draft stallions get uh, there's merit criteria. So for gold merit, um, I think they have to have one um at three um, first prizes at national show. So that's the national draft show or Dublin. Uh, he has a silver merit for dressage. So that means that he's got three scores over 64% at elementary level. Um, and he's silver merit for show jumping. So he has four double clears at 120 level. Um, I, and he I, I apologize for my leaping start here, but that's it's okay. Um, he jumped a couple of 130s with my dad last year as well. And as you see in the picture before, he's quite enough that Liam's kids can handle him um, and lead him and have to sit on at the show even. Um, so again, I just have a video of him doing a little bit of everything. Um, so he's show jumping there at um, Duffy's Equestrian Centre. I think that was the 115. Um, but what I love about him, look at his ears pricked. Uh, you know, look how much he loves his job, how easy he makes life for me. Um, and again, you know, I can bring him anywhere. What's lovely about him is I could actually load him up and I can bring him to shows by myself and you can pull him off the box and pull out the hop up and he's stand free to get on him. And he's super polite and safe and he's, you know, easy in the pocket. And like we talk about value, like you could use this as a sales video if we ever want to sell him. He's in Dublin there. Um, he has, in my opinion, so much value. Like if he was a gelding and you were selling him, you would. But I was sell just him. going to say, like this isn't even just talking about this. Is this is talking the values across the board? You know, yeah. when we're talking. Yeah. So, for, like, I think it, you said in one of the other talks, I think it was with Joe Burke. Like, value isn't always monetary. Like, absolutely, if we advertise him in the morning, he would have a lot of monetary value. But there's also, you know, he's very enjoyable for me. Uh, Liam can bring him to a show if he wants and he jumps him around sometimes uh, sometimes dad has a jump on him um, again the kids can handle him and they love him and they you know can lead him back to the stable after covering the mare they can have a sit on at the show he's safe he's reliable um, and he's competitive at everything he does you know we, we've had like he has won I'm not going to say we regularly do but he has won at everything he does from dressage to combine training to work in hunters he's he just like a really super horse um and like i always say he's the love of my life i'm so lucky mm -hmm. to have him in my life poor Declan, <laughs> Hannah. oh Declan understand he knows <laughs> but like particularly when you're selling you know most of our horses are for sale 95 percent of them will be sold you know within a year or two of you starting to ride them and he's not and that's huge value for me because I can get invested and attached and I have something, as Philip has said, to go to dressage lessons and to go to clinics and to try and work on improving myself and not always work on, you know, just getting the horse better. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, and, and, and you do invest a lot of yourselves in these animals when, you know, you're putting in all of this yeah. work. Oh, it's yeah. like yeah. all of your extra time. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But like I say, I don't know. No, like he has taken me to jumping or to dressage national championships taking me to dublin multiple times there he did one ridden class which is in that picture and he pulled a red rosette um and like how nice like we'll say if you think about breeding value like for me he has huge breeding value so i i have a fall off him this year now, obviously, I'm completely biased because I absolutely <laughs> love the horse. But the amount of people when I go into pocket that they always comment on how easy it is and how funny it is and how enjoyable. And the judge actually got off him in Dublin and apparently told somebody outside, oh, God, I'd let my child ride that horse. He's, you know, so polite and so easy. If if all of the people that commented on him, you know, a lot of them are amateur riders and are, are people like myself and Philippa that are working all the time and do this as a hobby. If they bred with him, the likes of him, maybe not necessarily him, but the likes of him, they would have a really fun time. Mm -hmm. Like, I just think it's wonderful using a top show jumper or a top dressage horse or event horse. But if I was standing here with ballet in one hand and that top horse in the other, 
And I said, you can have a spin on either of them. You know, and the pocket was a little bit busy. Which one would you choose to ride? Or your friends are going on the beach next week and you want to go for a gallop on the beach because all your friends are going, would you take Bala or would you take that top horse? You know, try to breed something that you can enjoy if that's the aim. Absolutely. You know, well, we don't want to breed a 145 horse. And if you want to sell that horse, great. But if you want to breed something for yourself, have a look at what that horse himself is doing. Well, it's back as well too, I guess, to, you know, what what the calibre of mare is that you have to begin with as well too. And looking to, you know, where her values are and, you know, how far your ambition should stretch with what you're starting yeah. from as well too. And I suppose the point of having this conversation with you girls this evening is to demonstrate that, you know, there is that much broader, wider market out there. Like there's a very small percentage yeah. that, that we, we spend a lot of time talking about that other top end market because it's, it's, it's what people have. And I, I don't think I don't think by breeding an all rounder, you're, you're not always like limiting yourself. Like Bala has jumped 130 with dad. Like most of the riders at the local shows that I see, 85 percent of them would have no aspirations to jump that height at all. Um, so he's he's going to suit that 85 percent and maybe more because as I said like he has jumped bigger but um you know like if particularly if you're breeding for yourself breed something that you think that you'll ride and enjoy yourself exactly exactly so now I am starting to look at the clock and that we don't drag this out like to the point of midnight tonight um, yes. so give us a quick point yeah. here. so I, I literally just included this picture because when we were talking about this um I was saying that I had bred a foal off Bala. So my mare is a warm blood mare um, and I'm absolutely delighted with the foal. But Wendy said, you know, who who are you breeding for? Who is buying this type of horse? And this is an example. It was by Moila Bouncer, which is Bala's father out with Silvano Dam. Um, again, she lean showed her. She was successful in the show ring. She had a foal um, and I started riding her again. Liam had actually done a little bit of jumping with her. So she was, you know, easy. I'd ride her during the week and he'd hop up at the weekend and she'd jump around for him. No problem. She was sold um, to an amateur rider. Um, this isn't an amateur rider in the photo. So she was suitable for an amateur rider and she qualified for Balmara Young Event Horse with her amateur rider. And then this is a professional rider who uh, borrowed her for the Young Event Horse qualifiers. So she qualified for Dublin. You know, she was talented enough to do that. She had one of the best dressage scores on the day. She jumped, I'm almost sure she was clear around the jumping and she finished placed. So you can see that like there's a really huge market for that. Type yeah. And those people have been in contact since wondering, uh, is there any other draft cross mare? <laughs> and to link that to that been. then, I actually covered my Harlequin Duke Corel mare, who is the mother of the dam of um, my SCT on rehorse that we discussed yeah. earlier. And one is in Italy show jumping. Mm -hmm. And Liam actually bought back the other mare and Hannah competed her um, yeah. for a season or two. And now she is breeding yeah. herself. Yeah. So it went full circle and they were very valuable. And like that, the people in Italy reached out to me to see, did I have any of those? So no more than Silvano, Harlequin Duke Corel, cross back to a draft, easy temperament, jump, bada bing, bada boom. Yeah. And, uh, and this mare had a super step and really good confirmation. She could have shown, she could have done work, but she could have done yeah. anything. Mm -hmm. So, okay, you can choose to, to take or pass this next question, right? Um, <laughs> a horse like DS Bala Bouncer as a seven-year-old geld in what price bracket? Is he likely to sell for versatility, temperament, and show wins? You know, in that um sort of uh, you know when you look at all of that in the equation, um and uh, you know <laughs> this person says, for example, fifteen to twenty k, etc. So, do you want a ballpark? So what they're asking us, it is a seven year old gelding. A seven year old gel. A seven year old gel. So, so with, uh, imagine Bala was seven and a gelding. Bella. Oh, okay. Is a okay. Basically. Yeah, they probably wouldn't be a million miles off the mark. Yeah, I, to be honest, I there's think so many variables again. The model and all of the variables are right. He's worth twenty thousand easily all day. Yeah. Okay. So Kingsman now moving on. Yeah. So just um, so this is kind of leading us into the thoroughbreds again, but also talking about kind of the traditional Irish horse and 
uh, sport horses. So this is a little horse again. So another 15 two horse that I bred out of a Luso mare. So a full thoroughbred mare that my mum had rescued um, from going to the factory, actually. So we rescued two little mares that time. And this is one of the offspring. So I have two other siblings. I have a half brother who is in the UK uh, eventing and I actually have the four year old fo- uh, half sister who I'll hope to get out and do a little bit on this year but she'll be more of an all rounder again mm-hmm. um, so this is um, Rupert and he's now in Scotland you can see in the top right hand corner competing very successfully as an intermediate show hunter pony Um, Mm -hmm. You can see below, so he was my COVID baby, should we say. So when I was bringing him on as a three and four year old, he was, this was the height of COVID. So there was nothing on, nothing to get him to, um, no way of going anywhere or marketing him successfully in that regard. However, I did mention to the ladies here that that picture of him moving, um, I posted that on Facebook and that picture sold him um, to the UK on scene. Mm-hmm. So the lady did mention that she, it's a well-known producer in the UK, that she had spotted some of the other pictures I had posted of him on social media. So like that bottom left-hand picture of him um, kind of in his summer coat looking well, she mm-hmm. had followed him. So I generally post them. This is, I think Wendy had mentioned to me before about my before and after pictures. And I kind of generally do a bit of a journey sometimes with some of the young horses that we're bringing on. So when they're first in, when they're first starting to look very well and then kind of middle of the show season. And sometimes I might do a before and after. Mm -hmm. And you can see the picture of me kind of, I think that's one of the first days I rode him in the yard and where he looks like a very scrawny, lean, leggy Mm -hmm. kind of, I think that was maybe early four-year-old year. year, So it would have been January maybe. Mm -hmm. Um, And he doesn't look like much in that photograph. Mm -hmm. Um, But if you look at the photograph below where he's trotting, he's really tracking up. So we said that before. So his, the two hooves, so his front hoof and his back hoof, he's nearly stepping into the imprint of his front hoof. And um, he's floating. Like, I think his only leg that's on the ground is his, are his two toes. You know, it's not like there's a foot on the ground. He has a bit of presence to him. His ears are pricked. He's looking forward up and through his bridle, which means that he's looking forward and, you know, riding up into this outline. Um, And he's really using himself. And as you can see then in the top right hand picture with his new family where he's being, you know, produced for the show ring, he looks the picture, you know, he looks the picture and he has a very good temperament. And that's an amateur girl who rides them. I think he is produced professionally, but an amateur girl rides him. Um, And I think she does do a few bits from home herself as well. And he's really gone on very well for me. So I'm looking forward to getting his sister out and about now or half sister out and about this summer. Yeah. Okay. And then... I suppose we'll 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 um finish up. We're finishing off with this slide in case anyone fears that we're still going to be at midnight. Um, but we did want to pay relevance to or reference to the thoroughbred as well. And you know, I suppose like they have a bit of a, you know, I I, I guess some people have the the mindset that the thoroughbred is difficult or the thoroughbred is you know like hard to keep and the thoroughbred has you know like Mm -hmm. these these barriers start to come up talk to us about your love for the the thoroughbred Philippa I suppose this is kind of a slightly new venture for me but it's not I shouldn't really say that because I'm steeped in thoroughbred heritage my granny and granddad both trained and rode national hunt and point to point but now my partner as I said Thomas Coyle we've a yard up here and we have a few national hunt and flash and point to point horses as long and I've my cob then stuck in the field because no stables for him um, but from that I suppose that love of thoroughbreds has come up through dad and um, then mum say I was just going to kind of prefix it by saying that that little Luso mare how valuable she has been to me for factory money she was you know um and like that's she's now had you know three successful offspring you know so that's invaluable to me if they're anyway decent and they're all all rounders so prefixing from that that's the little thoroughbred mare that you can pick that you can use that you can cross back to your thoroughbreds to your drafts to your Connemara ponies and you can get something that's going to suit that amateur market and but then you also have the geldings who maybe need to double up for another job and then these are two um thoroughbred geldings that I've worked with in recent years I might start with the below one he was just a little thoroughbred horse that I had for a friend um we had him for kind of eight to ten weeks so you can see the difference from when he arrived to when he left so that horse never ran on the track he had um 
he never made it to the track. He just didn't have the um, ability. So then what do you do with a horse like that? Well, you have to find a different path for him. So there's a really good organization at the moment that was set up jointly by with one of my friends and another lady um, called Troella. And they are really promoting the retraining and rehoming of the thoroughbreds in Ireland at the moment. And it's a really good platform. And I think they're getting quite a lot of publicity at the moment, a lot of promotion, a lot of sponsorship um, for this kind of rehoming and reproducing program. And um, you can just see the difference that eight weeks of correct feeding and correct lunging and riding made to Alfie, the bottom two pictures, and how he transformed. I genuinely think he looks like a different horse in those two pictures. And they're kind of my before and after photos that Wendy says can be quite, um, quite not shocking, but just as a big change, I suppose. Um, and often it's really important to remember that, that a lot of that can be to do with even the way the I, horse is I would actually call them quite impressive <laughs> because not... it shows the journey and, you know, and even to show like this, as you say, like it's an eight week turnaround here. I mean, you know, the significant differences, maybe you point those out. Yeah, so you can see there's a there's a change in the time of year slightly. So his coat has obviously changed. And um, so we got him at the end of the summer and we're coming into the winter. So his coat was coming. But apart from that, then so it looks like he's nearly changed color. His his color has deepened. But you can see the top line I was talking about earlier. So it's just from the wither to the pole, that kind of condition that he's built up. But really, the big change here with the horse as well is across his ribs. Okay, so the barrel of the horse. So we'd like to say that a, a horse should have a round you know be quite round of his barrel of his middles that you can sit into him and you can ride him and often the thoroughbreds can be a little bit flat of their middle they can be quite flat across the rib cage whereas you can see just with some with correct feeding and lunging and things how much he's built up across his rib cage and then also behind the saddle so you can see where sometimes their their quarters can be quite slanted and they can kind of fall away that with correct correct production that, that you can really start to round off those hind quarters and mm -hmm. um, and i also think then you can look at it above with milner who obviously is my even, my current even here you know all through here he's yeah, all strengthened all up out, all strengthened out yeah. Yeah. yeah but just for a moment when we look at this slide as well because I, I do want to leave this point for people also too i mean you know hannah you very aptly um emphasize the the um, value of good videos but i think philippa you also in how you present your photographs when you do put foot now and you've very kindly given a variety of photographs for this presentation but usually when you present your photographs on social media you know your photographs are all correctly stood up mm -hmm. just talk to us for a moment you know here so, as yeah against so here as against yeah, so Milner is my current racehorse to riding horse project and I very kindly was able to get him out of Henry de Bromheads because my cousin is one of the head lads in Henry de Bromheads and he wanted to kind of, I suppose, um, redirection his career path. Um, so you can see the picture on the left-hand side is just a picture taken um, by my cousin's wife who just wouldn't be horsey and just Milner was out at their house and you can see he looks like he's very much, it's just when he first came off the track. So when he last ran, he was actually fourth in Cheltenham. That was the last time he ever ran was he was fourth in the pretend hurdle in Cheltenham. So it was quite a, quite a feat, but he has had a couple of issues. So they just weren't going to put any more money into him. And you can see he's fit, you know, he's lean, but he's also standing under himself. So you can see what I mean by that is his two front legs are square, but they're underneath him. OK, so you can't see that lovely straight line from the point of his shoulder through his knee down his fetlock and to the ground. And the same behind. You should be able to see from the point of the buttock to the point of the hock, the fetlock to the ground. So you can kind of see it on Alfie at the bottom. You can draw that line down, whereas on Milner, he's standing underneath himself. So that would kind of be an incorrect way of presenting in hand, so to speak, whereas the bottom pictures of Alfie would be a correct way to present in hand. Now, from this side, yeah. if I was looking from the other side, I would move back or forward half a step to try and arrange our, rearrange our feet. And then generally, if a judge or someone is looking from the front, you'd like to try and have them square in front and then again behind, square behind. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's quite, it is quite a lot to think about sometimes, but there's lots of images online as well that people can refer to as a point of reference if they weren't sure, or kind of like manuals there that would show you how to presently present your horse in hand as well. 
Um, but yeah, you can just see the difference. Like even in the picture of Milner being presented, he was the novice Troella uh, winner and we were reserve champion ridden horse at the Lambertstown show in the final as well. Um, he's standing very square in that picture, but you can just see in general how much more he strengthened up through his body and everything. And that's really just production and feed. That's really it, what we've been kind of, but like that, I feel very strongly about this just quickly because We've, I've rehomed quite a lot of thoroughbreds here with Thomas as well recently. And there is a huge market for horses like this that people don't realise where they think that, as Wendy said, they don't have the temperament, they don't have the ability. But lots of these horses can go on and have very successful careers as kind of eventers, hunter trialling. Like one of the four-year-old horses we sold recently wasn't going to make it on the track and he was second in his first novice hunter trials the other day. And it's just a really big sphere that we can't forget about either. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And just a note out to one or two people just are saying yeah. that the the um the slides stuck for them at their end. Oh, sorry um, about that. Look at at this end, and um, for you guys, everything is fine. And if yeah. there was um, if there was a widespread problem, I would be getting a lot more messages. I'm quite sure of that. So okay. I, I I think it's maybe a delivery thing with broadband or whatnot. Okay. The, the recording seems to be working fine. We will make it available. Um, you know, it'll go online at www.chagas.ie forward slash Let's Talk Equine, as with all the rest of them. I'll promote it afterwards. You'll get the links there. People can go back and look at it in their own time again and all the images and all the rest are there. So, you know, don't, don't um, you know, I can't do much about it this evening if people are having that, that little issue at that point. Um, what would would there's an, there's two other questions in here which I'll take and those only, and then we'll 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 close out. Um, what would the best Irish horse sales to attend be if looking for a show horse, in your opinion? Um, a lot of very successful Scott. show horses have been found in Gores Bridge. Now, I've never purchased out of Gores Bridge, but a lot of very successful show horse, horses have been purchased out of Gores Bridge. So I'd say that would be. Yeah, I think, um, I guess, like, again, I haven't purchased out of either sale, but Gores Bridge or Cavan, you see lots of lovely horses. Um, if you're looking for a Connie or Connie Cross, obviously Clifton. Yeah. It just it really depends what you're looking yeah. for, you know. And then I think privately, a, a lot of horses seem to go as well. Even Dundee, you'd be surprised what you find on yeah. Dundee. There's um draft specific sales in Calvin and stuff like that. So it just really depends what you're looking for. And knowing what you're looking for. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Knowing what you're looking for. And what you're going to spend. <laughs> most importantly, yes, most importantly. Um, okay, so how would you go about getting contacts to view and buy untouched? untouched two or three year olds in Ireland they're like gold dust yeah they're like gold um, dust if you're like we've obviously built up contacts over years um if you're coming in from a different country like you regularly see people on Facebook asking that question if you put the question up you'll probably get recommended a lot of people like you know social media really is the future and it's the easiest way to connect with people I think yeah Ladies, we've covered a lot of ground. We've covered a lot of ground. Went slightly over time, Wendy. Yeah. <laughs> I'm in charge here. It's okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, everybody. I'm <laughs> Maybe I'm getting too relaxed at this job, but um, I, I do think that it merited giving the time to this conversation to allow the different... The, the different kinds of horses and ponies that we have touched on here to give people a little bit of a sense of that. Thank you to those who stuck with us and are rapidly departing us now, <laughs> but appreciate you giving us your time to be here and appreciate both of you being here. Is there any final, like just final um piece of advice or anything that you feel that you know we I didn't ask you or we left out or something that you'd like to say before we we say good night um I just think like get help and ask for help ask people who are out there doing the job that you want to do their opinion for their help be willing to accept criticism it's not if you ask for help and you ask for feedback you know I'll go to Philippa or I'll go to her dad Philip and I'll say what do you think of this and they'll be honest if I wasn't willing to accept the negative, you know, feedback, what was the point in asking? Yeah. Um, Remember that if you're, some of those disciplines are very subjective. So you have to be willing, as Hannah said, to take that in. Not if you're just looking for help. If you're presenting 
in this fear, a lot of the time you're going to get, you're not always going to be up there. You're not always going to get the best that you want or the result that you want. And it's just to bear that in mind and trying to improve that, as Hannah said, and trying to work on it yourself and see how you can improve it. And I suppose make sure that you're going to the right people for help, be they, you know, uh, again, people you're asking for advice, going for the right lessons, saddle fishers, back people, you know, just make sure that you're going to the right people. Have all your I's dotted and your T's crossed, you know, have your production down and have your have your basis there. And also, I think one of the things that's rung through throughout this chat has been honesty, I think, as well. I think that's very important. And of course, you know, just because you're honest doesn't mean that everybody else you're dealing with is honest so you know if you're feeling that you're not getting the right vibe move on and talk elsewhere you know yeah for sure um listen ladies you've been a pleasure to chat with i've enjoyed the conversation i hope that people at home have and will when they get to look at after this is the last let's talk equine for before our summer break um so um we you know the evenings are getting longer now and um no doubt people will be out looking after their falling mares and their youngsters and out showing and out adding value for the season ahead so to both of you, I wish you a successful show, production, etc. summer. Um, and for any young stock that you are awaiting or foals you're waiting and all the rest of it. And um, I, I really appreciate the pair of you giving your time to sit and chat with me this evening. And um, to our viewers at home, um, uh, just to thank you also for your attention and to really thank people for their engagement this evening and for sending in the variety of different questions and um, showed that they were interested to hear what you were saying. So good night and thank you very much and um, have a good summer. everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everyone for tuning in. Thank you, yep. Wendy. Thanks, Hannah. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Bye. Good night, Sloan.